Well, all the petitions related to last week's violence in Delhi, including that of hate speech, will now be heard by the Delhi High Court on Friday, which happened after the Supreme Court ordered them to do so. The court turned down the centre's plea today, asking for more time. The Supreme Court also frowned upon the High Court's long adjournment of the case, saying that delaying such matters is not justified. A clutch of petitions were filed in the Supreme Court by the victims of the violence, asking for action against BJP leaders who made hate speeches, which allegedly played a key role in the spread of violence in Northeast Delhi last week. The group had approached the top court after the Delhi High Court last week gave the police four weeks to provide an update on action taken against the leaders accused of inciting violence over the controversial citizenship law. After an hour-long hearing on petition seeking immediate registering of FIRs against BJP leaders Kapil Mishra, Anurag Thakur and Parvesh Verma and constitution of special investigation team to probe the riots, the Supreme Court today transferred a petition by 10 Delhi riot victims to the Delhi High Court and asked the High Court to list the matter on Friday on priority. That's six weeks sooner than listed. A three-judge bench headed by the Chief Justice of India said we request the Delhi High Court to list the matter on Friday as the long delay in the matter is not justified. The High Court should hear it as expeditiously as possible. The Delhi High Court had listed the matter on the riots on April 13th. During the hearing, the petitioner's lawyer Colin Gonsalves pressed for the arrest of leaders who made hate speeches. The Chief Justice of India pointed out that it could lead to more violence. Gonzalez said, if the culprits had been arrested, there would not have been violence. The Chief Justice of India responded saying, we know what happened in Mumbai violence. When Ashaka Pramukh was arrested, the violence flared up. The Supreme Court also refused to hear social activist Harsh Mandar's petition after the centre's lawyer, Solicitor General Tushar Mehta, claimed that in January, Mandar had made a statement at an anti-CA protest where he said that he does not have faith in the Supreme Court and that real justice can be done on the streets. Supreme Court ने इंसानियत और समानता और सेक्युलरों की रक्षा नहीं की है। इस देश का क्या भविष्य होगा? आप लोग सब नौजवान हैं। आप अपने बच्चों को किस तरह का देश देना चाहते हैं? ये फैसला कहाँ होगा? एक सड़कों पर होगा। कौन सी जगह में इस लड़ाई का फैसला सबसे ज़्यादा होगा? वो है अपने दिलों में। the Chief Justice said the allegations against Mandar are serious. The court will not hear Mandar till the issue on allegations against him are sorted out. Now the petition by the riot victims will be heard this Friday in the Delhi High Court, while the Harsh Mandar's petition will be taken up only after Solicitor General Tushar Mehta's affidavit against Mandar for his alleged contemptuous statements. In New Delhi with Sukirti Dwedi, this is Arunachalam Vaidyanathan, NDTV. Well, much has been said about the role of the judiciary, not just uh, with regard to the violence in Delhi recently, but over the last several months on a slew of issues, including Jammu and Kashmir. Joining us this evening is Justice Madan Lokur, who is retired from the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Lokur, thank you very much for joining us on NDTV this evening, sir. If I could ask you first about the Supreme Court's intervention uh, in, the, in the Delhi matter today, uh, would you say that this was much needed at the end of the day, given the time the High Court had given to the police? Oh yes, I think it was very much needed. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, did the right thing by uh, requesting the Delhi High Court to take up the matter on priority. And I believe it's now going to come up on the 6th, that's uh, day after tomorrow. So what did you make of the, the, the Delhi High Court giving so much time to the police? The fact that, uh, you know, you had Justice Murli Dhar's bench just one day earlier giving uh, you know, the police just 24 hours to, to come forward and, and decide on these FIRs on hate speech. And then the same High Court, a different bench, giving as long as four weeks to the police to reply and then giving an, you know, six weeks in all before the next hearing. Uh, that frankly did uh, make a lot of people question the judiciary. Yes, uh, well... <laughs> I, I think it was a little unfortunate, uh, you know, that uh, so much time had been given. Uh, there was definitely urgency in the matter. And uh, I think the uh, Delhi High Court should have taken up the case on a priority basis. You know, uh, the uh, registration of an FIR is not such a big deal, you know, that uh, you need four weeks time for all that. 
Uh, I mean, if, if there's a problem, the FIR has to be registered. After. It's the first information report and it can't be after four weeks or something. It, it, well, to me, it doesn't make uh, much sense, so, giving so much of time. So what did you make of the way Justice Mudlidhar was suddenly transferred out as well? Uh, again, we do know that he was meant to move to the Punjab and Haryana High Court. That order had already come. But the suddenness with which he was moved out the same night, hours after he read the riot act to the police, did, did you feel that the timing was inappropriate? I, I think the timing was uh, completely inappropriate. Uh, you know, it, it could have been done a day later, it could have been done two days later. I mean, what is the urgency, you know? No, nobody knows what the urgency was to transfer uh, uh, the judge, uh, you know, at about 11 o'clock at night, I believe. You know, I don't know, it's, 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 it's very strange. So then, g given that, how, how does one protect the judiciary you know, from such interference. In your view, there is obvious, I mean, this is not just about this one case of Justice Murli Dhar's transfer, but there is a there is a bigger issue at play here about the independence of the judiciary. And how does one shield the judiciary then from this kind of interference? Well, you see, it's like this. <clears throat> uh, all the uh, transfer orders in the past, uh, you know, gave some time to the uh, judge to join the uh, high court to which he or she was transferred. Uh, there is a reason for that. The reason is that, uh, you know, some case may have been heard and judgment may have been reserved. So it gives time to that judge to deliver judgment, right? Now, in respect of these three transfers that took place, uh, you know, no time was given. And as far as I'm concerned, I think it's the first time it has happened. Now, take a situation where after having received the transfer order, say at about 11 o'clock at night or whatever time it was uh, received, uh, the learned judge had gone to Punjab and Haryana High Court and reached there the next day at uh, 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the morning. What would he have done? You know, I mean, he's still a judge of the Delhi High Court. Uh, he's not been sworn in as a judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court and he's been directed to join over there. Fine, he would have uh, gone there and told the Chief Justice, here I am, you know, what next? You, you wrote a very strong piece on India's Republic Day this year saying, uh, you know, that the freedom... Oh, sorry. You wrote a very strong piece in, 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 in the newspaper, in, in the Hindustan Times, where you said the freedom of the judiciary and the top court has been sought to be compromised on several occasions in the past, but it has always bounced back. Can you elaborate on that, sir? Well, uh, if you uh, go back, you know, to the case of uh, ADM Jabalpur, right, uh, the Supreme Court had, uh, you know, uh, given a judgment which was uh, very, very odd. But uh, soon after that, I think maybe in about uh, five or ten years or something, uh, the Supreme Court came back uh, to its, uh, you know, normal prestige. Uh, by introducing uh, public interest litigation, legal aid and so on. Uh, then in the late 1990s also there was a problem. Uh, but uh, again the Supreme Court uh, bounced back. So yes, we've uh, been going through a tough time. I mean the Supreme Court has been going through a tough time in the last couple of years. But uh, I think as an institution it will bounce back. What, though, do you think is the way out, sir, with regard to transparency over judicial appointments in particular? Again, that is something you have written very strongly about in the past. Uh, because we have a system of the collegium, uh, which at the moment is possibly the only system that, that, that can work w uh, without too much interference from the executive, but it's still very opaque. And there is clearly a greater need for transparency. So how do we bring that transparency within the appointment of judges, with the appointment of judges, without the interference of the executive? What do you think is the best way? Well, uh, you know, it has to be discussed. Uh, the uh, government, of course, has a point of view. The judiciary has a point of view. And, uh, you know, I believe that the collegium system needs a little bit of tweaking in terms of uh, transparency and so on. And... Um, you know, sending letters across uh, to the, uh, you know, Department of Justice or to the law minister doesn't really serve any purpose. 
I, I think if there is a problem, it should be discussed across the table and sorted out. I mean, it's, 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 it's not such a complicated affair. How would you make it more transparent if you had to? How would you tweak it? Well, uh, there are several things, uh, you know, in which uh, it can be tweaked. For example, uh, if the uh, Supreme Court Collegium does not agree with uh, a recommendation made by the uh, High Court Collegium, then there could be a discussion with the High Court Collegium to understand why they have made that recommendation. The impression that the Supreme Court Collegium carries may be wrong, or, you know, or may be erroneous. Um, so again, if it is discussed with the uh, judges of the uh, High Court, such as the Chief Justice and the other two members of the High Court Collegium, uh, you know, things could be sorted out. Uh, why have you recommended a particular person when there is, you know, uh, some allegations against him? Uh, the Chief Justice may say, well, I had inquired into those allegations and I found that there is nothing in it. So, so you're you saying know, there should be more openness. There, there has to be a dialogue. I mean, <laughs> right? More dialogue. That's important. That's what there you're should saying. be more openness, and there should be a greater, you know, communication. Yeah, and greater communication between the High Court Collegium and the Supreme Court Collegium. So you had also said in 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 that piece that you wrote on on the judiciary on Republic Day, and I just want to read out the, these lines. You had said we're also witnessing judgmental fluctuations by the Supreme Court perceived by many as succumbing to the pressures of the establishment in its core function. What has happened to the independence of the judiciary, they ask. Can I ask you about this? Because there has been a lot of criticism, like you said, over the past couple of years, and particularly in the last six, seven months, for instance, in the way that the top court has dealt with habeas corpus petitions in the Supreme Court related to, say, Jammu and Kashmir, or restrictions on, on, on basic fundamental liberties, uh, fundamental rights. Uh, if, if you could just take us through what you meant on these judgmental fluctuations in this context. Well, yeah, you see, there are two things. <clears throat> One is, uh, you know, the uh, independence of the judiciary and uh, the executive, in a sense, getting an upper hand, right? So you could have that in a situation where uh, the executive does not process the case uh, of a particular judge who has been recommended for appointment by the Supreme Court Collegium. Okay, that I think will impinge upon the independence of the judiciary because the government can sit on the file and say that, well, we'll take our own time to uh, decide. The other aspect is where the uh, Supreme Court or any constitutional court does not do what it is expected to do under the constitution. Now, uh, for example, uh, you had the uh, case of uh, children who had been, um, you know, allegedly kept under detention in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Now, there were reports that had been uh, filed in the Supreme Court, but which were not shown to the petitioner or to the advocate for the petitioner. And, uh, you know, the case was virtually thrown out, right? So, in a matter of a habeas corpus petition, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court has to be far more proactive or any constitutional court for that matter has to be far more proactive than it has been in the last uh, couple of months. Right. Well, well, important words from you there, sir. Uh, can I though ask you that wh when you look at the functioning of, of the court today and the anguish which some of the judges had expressed in, you know, from the Supreme Court uh, famously, infamously, you know, a few years ago, do you think things have changed uh, for the better or are we, uh, is there still some way to go? Well, things uh, did uh, improve a little bit, you know, uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I really can't say today, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, you're, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's, your it's smile difficult. says it all, sir. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have yeah. faith that, that the Supreme Court would bounce back uh, from this because for, for all of us as citizens, uh, yeah. it, it is still the one institution that we look to for justice. And I think if people in a democracy uh, don't even have that, then I don't know what we're left with. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. You know, things like, uh, you know, the shutdown of internet, uh, we had that in Delhi, uh, you know. Uh, 
uh, you know, the, 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 these are issues that create problems and the Supreme Court uh, or the High Court, uh, in this case the Delhi High Court, uh, they should intervene, you know. I mean, you can't let uh, everybody get away with everything all the time. Finally, one last question, Justice Lokur. It's something that Arun Jaitley had said when he was in the opposition, uh, when, when the UPA was in power. I think it, it, I think it was at that time, or maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. But anyway, I remember Arun Jaitley had said that one of the biggest problems was giving judges post-retirement uh, positions, uh, particularly in the immediate aftermath of their retirement. Do you think that that is a practice that actually should be done away with? That there has to be a moratorium at least of a couple of years before uh, judges of the Supreme Court are given any position? Is this part of the problem, you think? Well, it is uh, you know, very debatable in the sense that uh, if the government believes that judges should not be given any post-retirement uh, you know, commissions and so on, nobody is compelling them to do it. You know, so they, they need not give it, right? So, uh, I mean, what, what, what do you expect a judge to do? But perhaps put it down in law that, you know, such postings will not be allowed for two years or, or just not, not allow them at all. Keep, keep, the, keep the independence of the judiciary completely yeah, fine, okay. sacrosanct. You are okay with that? Yeah, it's yeah, perfectly okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. All right. Well, Justin Madan Lokur, thank you, sir, very much for joining us tonight to talk about uh, the position of the higher judiciary, the Supreme Court in particular, and for being very forthright in your views about what you think needs to be fixed. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.